Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we witnessed the Fourth Dynasty rule as the apex of Egyptian power. We left off with Egypt's economy gradually declining, but remaining healthy overall, when the first pharaoh of the Fifth Dynasty, Uzerkoff, took the throne. With that said, let's jump right in. Episode 9, The Rise of the Cult of Ra. So, during the last episode, I mentioned something in an offhanded comment and then realized that I totally should have elaborated on it further. That was, how the shift from step pyramids to smooth-sided pyramids came from a change in religious ideology of the Egyptian state. The new smooth pyramid sought to associate these pharaoh's tombs with the rising solar cult. But what exactly is this solar cult? So, as we've learned in previous episodes, religious controversy was not an uncommon thing in ancient Egypt. Before Narmer united the region, most cities just worshipped their local protector gods, and when Narmer united Egypt, he united these disparate and sometimes contradictory gods into one pantheon. But due to the cobbled together nature of this pantheon, its hierarchy wasn't really clear, and the religion was still based on primarily local grounds, with cities worshipping their locally associated god before all others. Egypt later went through a major religious conflict during the late Second Dynasty with Upper Egyptian kings forsaking Horus in favor of Set as their most important god. However, in the late Second Dynasty, a new religious faction began to rise surrounding a minor solar deity called Ra. The theological origins of Ra are unclear to say the least, but because his worship centered primarily around the city of Iyunu in Lower Egypt, this strongly implies that the belief in Ra originated there. The character of this cult of Ra is largely unknown, while the term cult conjures up imagery of shadow priests or poison Kool-Aid, in ancient Egypt a cult just referred to a small following of dedicated worshippers. Ra's cult spread rapidly throughout Lower Egypt during the reign of Khazakhemwe, and continued to spread at this quick pace during the Third Dynasty. By the end of the Third Dynasty, the cult was well established throughout the entirety of the Egyptian kingdom. By this time, the role of Ra had transformed within the minds of his creators. He was no longer just a sun god, but was the self-created progenitor of all things in the universe. How mainstream Egyptian society initially responded to this growing cult is unclear. What is clear, though, is that by the time of the Fourth Dynasty, the cult of Ra now was the mainstream. Pharaohs began building their tombs in a way that conformed to solar worship, and, starting with Jedifra, even began claiming to be the direct descendants of Ra himself. So, why am I talking about this now, instead of last episode? Well, while the cult of Ra was already influential on the pharaohs during the 4th dynasty, the 5th dynasty pharaohs would really take this veneration to a whole new level. The first pharaoh of the 5th dynasty, Uzerkoth, was the illegitimate son of Shepsekoth, the last pharaoh of the 4th dynasty. He was already a grown man when his father died with no legitimate heirs, and so he ascended to the throne. While there was nothing resembling of an outbreak of civil war, Uzerkoth's position on the throne was incredibly unsafe. Countless rivals from the dynastic family, ambitious members of the bureaucracy, and the powerful priestly class were well aware of the illegitimacy of Uzerkov's snatching of royal authority. While nobody would dare openly question the pharaoh's authority, Uzerkov's rivals schemed in the shadows regarding how to best topple him. Like Sneferu before him, Uzerkov had to find a way to strengthen his legitimacy to secure his spot on the throne. The first way he did this was by marrying his stepmother slash aunt, you, Khentkos which further tied him into the lineage of the previous pharaohs. This is, of course, not too unusual in Egyptian history, as inbreeding was the norm in royal marriages. The family of the fourth dynasty was still a powerful force in the Egyptian state, and marrying into this family would quiet potential enemies from within the dynastic court. Seeing that Uzerkov's position was growing more secure, his dynastic rivals and their supporters fled into the deserts of Libya. With his rivals within the royal family pacified or in exile, Uzerkov still needed to ensure that he could find a base of support among the mainstream public, which he found within the powerful cult of Ra. By the time Uzerkov took the throne, the cult of Ra was the most influential cult in the Egyptian kingdom. Recognizing the influence held by the cult, Uzerkov tried to endear himself with its leadership. While previous pharaohs provided mere lip service to this growing religion, Uzerkov proclaimed the cult to be the new hegemonic state religion. While cults surrounding the worship of other gods were allowed to continue, they could only do so in a way that made them clearly subservient to the cult of Ra. Instead of funneling exorbitant resources towards the construction of magnificent tombs like his ancestors, Uzerkov instead funneled these resources into the construction of a massive solar temple, 
he chose Abu Sir, an empty site north of Memphis, to be the site of his grand temple, and construction began in the fifth year of his reign. During its heyday, the temple must have been something to behold. It was known as Nechend Ra, or Ra's Fortress, composed of two sections, an upper temple, which sat atop a hill, and a valley temple. During service each night, the priests would wait until they saw certain constellations arise from the horizon, and then descend from the upper temple down to the valley temple, where they would sacrifice two geese and two cattle as offerings to Ra. Nechan Ra was built of polished limestone, granite, and diorite, the most expensive building materials available at the time. Like Richard Attenborough in Jurassic Park, Uzerkov spared no expense. Regardless of if Uzerkov was a true believer in the cult or was just cynically using them to secure support, the cult's influence and wealth expanded immensely under his reign. He granted them tens of thousands of acres of agricultural estates, appointed several priests of the cult to positions within the royal bureaucracy, and showered them with silver from the royal treasury. Priests of the cult of Ra commissioned impressive tombs for themselves, and enjoyed material wealth only surpassed by the fortune of the royal family itself. With the loyalty of the cult ensured, Uzerkov had finally secured a base of support large enough to ensure his security on the throne. Now he could finally begin to rule like a normal pharaoh. In response to a rise of an early form of piracy on the Mediterranean, Uzerkov saw a massive expansion of Egypt's naval capabilities. This naval expansion opened the door to a massive increase in maritime trade. During his reign, we have our first evidence of contact between the Greek and Egyptian worlds, with trade contact being established between the Egyptians and Minoan peoples of ancient Crete. Additionally, he led a military expedition into Libya to find and punish those who had opposed his reign, as well as to collect tribute in the form of cattle from the Libyan tribes. Despite the massive impact of his reign in Egyptian history, it was a short one, as Uzerkov ruled for only eight years. In a return to tradition, Uzerkov ordered the construction of his tomb in Saqqara. Whether due to his short reign or his focus on spending resources on solar temples, Uzerkov's pyramid is humble compared to those of his predecessors, only about half the size of Djoser's original step pyramid. While the pyramid remained intact for hundreds of years, it was eventually harvested for building materials, which caused its collapse. Today, the pyramid resembles a small pile of disheveled stones, unfit for such an impactful ruler. When Uzerkov died, his heir, a boy named Sakura, meaning he who is close to Ra, took the throne after a brief regency by his mother. Upon assuming the throne, Sakura, like his father, took a keen interest in the Egyptian navy. He continued expanding the Egyptian fleet, both in the Mediterranean and Red Seas, ordering expeditions to the northern Canaanite lands of modern Lebanon, and south to the land of Punt in the modern nations of Ethiopia and Somalia. These expeditions established trade routes that would provide Egypt with many important luxury goods in the future, like electrum, ebony wood, ivory, and incenses from Punt as well as cedar trees from northern Canaan. Apparently, the ship even carried back a group of 12 Syrian brown bears and paraded them around the streets of Memphis as a fascinating curiosity. He also continued his father's religious policies and further expanded the power of, of the ever more influential cult of Ra. Sahura's reign was internally peaceful, with no rebellions occurring against his reign within Egypt. Externally, however, Sahara's reign was plagued with foreign wars. First, the Sinai Peninsula, the ever-important source of most of Egypt's copper, rose in rebellion. Encouraged by this defiance of Egyptian authority, the Berber nomads and city-states of the Libyan desert also decided to stop sending tribute. And, as if this wasn't bad enough, the Nile Delta was attacked in a series of especially bad pirate raids the same year. Fortunately, the building up of the Egyptian navy paid off, and Sahara was able to fight off these maritime raiders with relative ease. He then successfully destroyed the rebellious tribes within the Sinai, before turning his attention to Libya. The Libyans proved more difficult to subdue, but were ultimately brought back to subservience after years of conflict. It appears that Egyptian forces took out their anger from this prolonged war on the Libyans, ransacking the region for all it was worth. The army slowly slogged its way back to Egypt across the desert with an unprecedentedly large horde of livestock tribute in tow. To ensure that the Libyans wouldn't get any ideas again in the future, Sahara ordered the creation of a new settlement in the western delta region, known as Hutjewut. This settlement was built to act as a military garrison, if war with the Libyans ever broke out again. His subjugation of the Libyans would be one of Sahara's proudest achievements, 
On the wall of his funerary temple, there is a mural depicting Sakura conversing with the god Ash, the deity of oases and the god associated with the deserts of Libya. The god praises Sakura for his accomplishments. I give to you all that is within Libya. I give you all hostile peoples with all the provisions within their foreign lands. I grant thee all western and eastern lands with all the savage bowmen within and throughout the world. As well as his accomplishments in war, Sahara was also an accomplished ruler in statecraft. He promoted a new position within the bureaucracy, the overseer of the western desert, to ensure a smooth and stable collection of tribute from Libya in the future. In fact, Sahara oversaw a large expansion of the bureaucracy more generally, but, unlike previous pharaohs, practiced a system of relative meritocracy. Instead of promoting members of the royal family to positions of bureaucracy, he would instead promote commoners and nobles who were, get this, actually good at their jobs. This relatively meritocratic system was far more effective than the previous system, where you would withhold power only to your mostly incompetent relatives, and the efficiency of the Egyptian government flourished as a result. Throughout his reign, Sahara was truly viewed as the conqueror of the world and as a great king. His reign did not last especially long, only 12 years. However, Sahura made a lasting impression on the people of Egypt, and continued to be worshipped long after his death, with his status as a popular deity lasting well into the New Kingdom period, thousands of years later. And it's easy to see why. Sahara is one of those undeniably effective pharaohs who was pretty easy to take a liking to. Apparently, he was a kind ruler to his own people, but also a fierce martial king when the time for war came. He was a great conqueror, yet a responsible statement who implemented effective bureaucratic reforms. He was an ambitious monument builder, but also didn't forget about the importance of cultivating trade and economic growth. Truly, he was everything to everyone. He was laid to rest in Abu Sir, in a relatively humble pyramid like his father. Sahara was succeeded to the throne by his eldest son, Nefirkara. Throughout his 10-year reign, Egypt enjoyed a period of peace and stability. Honestly, with regards to his rule, there is very little to tell about, as he remains somewhat enigmatic in historical records. But what little we do know about him paints him as an especially benevolent ruler. This is evidenced by a contemporary story involving how he treated his royal court. So, the story goes that there's this guy named Rawr. Rawr is a bureaucrat who is quite elderly by this point, being a veteran official who was also present during the reign of Sakura. He was likely a royal stylist, or some other position close to the pharaoh. Anyways, so Rawr is attending one of the countless royal ceremonies that occur nearly constantly in the palace at Memphis. He walks past Neferkari, who is holding a royal mace, and slips embarrassingly. No big deal, we've all been there, right? Well, wrong. When Rawr slips, he falls directly on to Neferkara and ends up knocking down the pharaoh, and even ends up touching the royal mace. Now, keep in mind that Neferirkara isn't just some guy, he's the freaking son of Ra, a living god, and Rawr just slipped onto him like he's in a slapstick comedy. And if that's not bad enough, he touched the royal mace. This is like the ancient Egyptian equivalent of burning the Quran in front of God himself. So under normal circumstances, that's it. Nice knowing you Rawr, hope you enjoy your painful execution. I mean, people have been beheaded for way less. But Neferirkara stands up and basically just says, I hope you're okay, and then moves on. Apparently, during another one of these ceremonies, Neferirkara's vizier suffered from a heat stroke. Instead of just continuing the ceremony like nothing was happening, as was customary, Neferirkara springs into action and immediately summons his royal physician to help the vizier. Now, from our modern perspective, neither of these actions sound particularly unusual. Like, wow, you didn't let your advisor die from heatstroke or execute an old man for falling onto you by accident. You want a medal? But, keep in mind, this was genuinely unusual for Egyptian royalty. Pharaohs are raised, usually from birth, to believe themselves to be literal deities. They're surrounded at all times by sycophantic advisors who constantly praise them and say that they can do no wrong, and heap never-ending praise upon their every decision. Honestly, if this was my upbringing, I'd probably be narcissistic enough to let a guy die of heatstroke too. So, we've been talking a lot about which pharaohs were effective or ineffective rulers throughout the podcast, but for the first time I can confidently say that Neferirkari is the first pharaoh who actually sounds like a decent guy. Anyways, in addition to being a pretty chill dude, apparently Neferirkari was also a fairly effective ruler, 
with his decade of rule being a time of economic growth for Egypt. In a return to tradition, Neferikari wanted to be buried in a step pyramid like that of Djoser. However, he unfortunately died before his tomb could be completed, and the remaining structure is largely in ruins today. Neferirkara's son, Neferira, is barely worth noting. He ascended to the throne, and then immediately died within the first two years. An enigmatic man named Shepsakara took the throne. Contemporary sources on this pharaoh are practically non-existent, with his relation to the royal family being incredibly unclear. Some believe that he was a usurper who seized the throne after a brief period of conflict following Neferira's death, but it is more likely that Shepsakara was either the king's uncle or an influential advisor, who served as regent until the next in line of the throne, a boy named Nusera, was old enough to rule in his own right. I personally buy into this theory, as there is little to no evidence of military conflict in Egypt during this time. Regardless of how he came to power or who he was, Shepsakara's role in Egyptian history is nearly non-existent, as most of his projects went unfinished by the end of his seven-year reign. Nusera was the next pharaoh to rise to power. Nusera enjoyed a long reign, ruling for more than three decades, but accomplished little. He was a rather ineffectual, if inoffensive, ruler, focusing most of his energy on the ceremonial duties of the pharaoh, rather than on the material responsibilities of ruling a kingdom. However, with his inaction, Nusera refused to act on a growing crisis within the Egyptian state. You see, during the seven years of regency that preceded him, the throne of Egypt was essentially empty. As a result, most of the actual work of administration was done by the bureaucracy, local government, and priesthood. When Nusera rose to power, the newfound influence of these classes was something that needed to be wrangled in as had happened under the earlier pharaohs of the dynasty. However, Nusera did nothing, and instead allowed this power to expand unchecked. The only projects that Nusera seemed concerned about were that of the construction of solar temples, and the construction of his own tomb. Infrastructure, trade, irrigation, all were left to the bureaucracy to handle it. Nusera was very popular during his time as pharaoh, and was even extensively worshipped after his death. But ultimately, his reign accomplished nothing but the undermining of royal authority. After more than 30 years on the throne, Nusera was buried at Abusir. His brother, Menkahor, succeeded Nusera to the throne. His reign is not especially well attested to, but from what little is known, he seems to have continued the policies of his brother. After eight uneventful years on the throne, he died, and rule passed on to his son, Jedkara. Unlike his successors, Jedkara would not sit idly by as an inoffensive and ineffective ruler. Instead, he would do something far worse. Upon ascending to the throne, Jedkara inherited an Egypt where royal authority was rapidly declining. By this point, while the pharaoh was still the uncontested spiritual leader of Egypt, much of the material power of the kingdom was in the hands of the bureaucrats. Now, unlike his predecessors, Jedkara recognized that this was a problem, and decided that action was necessary to reverse this trend. He set out an ambitious plan of civil and religious reforms that he thought would permanently weaken the power of the royal bureaucracy in the cult of Ra, and restore his absolute power in the process. The first of these reforms was straightforward. Jedkara abandoned the dynasty's ties with the cult of Ra. The partnership with the cult of Ra and the fifth dynasty pharaohs was initially mutually beneficial. The cult gave its support to Uzerkov, and in exchange he gave the cult resources and influence. Jedkara, though, figured that this partnership had outlived its usefulness. After all, Uzerkov had risen to the throne decades ago, and the fifth dynasty's place on the throne was now secure. If anything, the solar cult was now just a parasite on the state and was becoming a threat to the pharaohs itself. So, to undermine the influence of the established religion, Jedkara challenged the cult's authority and shifted the favor of the royal dynasty to the growing, yet much smaller, cult of Osiris, god of the dead. If you've been listening for a long time, you might remember that Osiris originated as the patron deity of Abydos. Unlike the cult of Ra, which was based in Iyunu, just up the road from Memphis, the cult of Osiris was still based in Abydos, which was all the way down the Nile, which limited their potential influence in the capital. Now, this initially seems like a pretty good idea. Replace the cult that is threatening your power with a much weaker and further away alternative. However, this decision quickly became a problem. For one, with the choice of Osiris, the god of the dead, as the new main god of Egypt, Jedkara strongly reduced the theological role held by the pharaoh. By choosing a god so closely associated with the afterlife, Jedkara weakened the role of the pharaoh as the guarantor of afterlife. 
and thus removed much of the pharaoh's theological prestige. After all, why should I pray to and worship the pharaoh anyways? Osiris is the one who ultimately give me an afterlife, not the pharaoh, so why not just pray directly to him? Additionally, while shifting the center of religion away from Memphis was part of the goal, this ended up backfiring immensely on Jed Kara. While this decision had reduced the influence of religious institutions on the pharaoh, it also made it harder for the pharaoh to associate himself with the religion through the regular practice of rituals, conducting of sacrifices, and building of temples in Egypt's holiest city, as that city was now hundreds of miles further away. Oops. As if the weakening of the pharaoh's religious authority wasn't enough, Jedkara also decided to implement a series of ill-conceived state reforms. Like his religious reforms, Jedkara's plan to reform the bureaucracy makes sense in an abstract sense. It was meant to address a problem which was very real, that being the rapid expansion of the power of royal bureaucrats. The first of these reformed was the undoing of the meritocratic system established by Sakura, replacing it with the old system of royal family members holding the most important positions within the bureaucracy. While the idea is that this will increase the loyalty of these bureaucrats through blood ties, the unintended result was that competent government officials were replaced with incompetent officials with family ties. This reduced the efficiency of the bureaucracy, meaning that even more officials had to be hired to compensate for this loss of efficiency. So far, this reform to weaken the bureaucracy has just increased the number of people within the bureaucracy, and thus made it harder for the pharaoh to control. Good job. So, the last reform was a bit of a swing and a miss. How about we try to reduce the power of lower-level royal bureaucrats as well? These lower-level bureaucrats had quickly become a growing center of power in the Egyptian state, often holding multiple titles and offices at a time. Jedkara figured that if he could weaken the power of these officials, this would concentrate more power within the vizier at the top of the bureaucratic hierarchy, which would make it easier for the pharaoh to manage. He prohibited the practice of lower officials holding more than one title at a time, which worked. Yes, the power of these lower officials was severely weakened. However, this didn't really increase the power of the pharaoh as much as it increased the power of local nomarchs. So, if anything, this just moved power from the hard-to-control lower royal officials to the even harder-to-control local governors. So, all of Jedkara's reforms have failed so far, and have done the exact opposite of their goal. Rather than strengthening royal power, they have, if anything, weakened it even more. Jedkara spent the next three decades continuing to try and fail to restore his royal power, and usually continued to make the problem worse in the process. After 33 disastrous years on the throne, he passed away and was buried in a pyramid complex in southern Sakura. He left the now significantly weaker throne to his son, Unas. So, before we talk about Unas, I want to give a super quick, oversimplified summary of an economic concept called economies of scale. So, in super basic, tremendously oversimplified terms, economies of scale is the principle that, due to myriad factors, as the scale of an economic operation grows, the efficiency with which it operates will increase. So, how is this relevant to Egypt? Well, Egypt decentralized rapidly under Jedkara's reign with nomarchs enjoying an unprecedented amount of power while the power of the king shrunk tremendously. And, as Egypt decentralized, so too did its economic operations, like farming, construction, irrigation, and trade. The responsibility of managing these projects, once entrusted to Egypt's royal government, was now meant to be fulfilled by local nomarchs, who commanded much smaller labor forces. As Unas took the throne, he inherited a kingdom whose economy was rapidly disintegrating, what, however, while Egypt's economic fortunes were heading for the worst, the royal treasury was still full of silver from previous periods of wealth. Unas pumped this money into myriad building projects, giving the impression that everything was fine. While the economic toxin was present in Egypt's system, it wasn't showing symptoms yet. Sure, the efficiency of labor on essential infrastructure project was going down the tubes, but the king could still import limestone for his building projects. Incense was still coming from Punt copper from Sinai, and cedar from Canaan. He could still afford to raise armies to send into Nubia to collect tribute. Nothing to worry about. Unlike his father, Unas did not attempt desperate, disastrous reforms, but instead took the path of the earlier pharaohs by ignoring the problem altogether. Instead, he focused his effort on the continual fight to establish the cult of Osiris as Egypt's new state religion a task in which he was pretty successful. He tried to reconcile the new cult with the old cult of Ra, by establishing that both gods played an important role in entering the afterlife. 
Unas' reign lasted for an impressive 30 years, but little was accomplished in material terms during this long reign. In fact, this long reign was, if anything, a disservice to Unas, as his son passed away shortly before Unas himself died, bringing an end to Egypt's fifth dynasty. The throne of Egypt was empty. However, the average Egyptian likely would have never even noticed. Throughout Unas' 30 years of rule, the power of the pharaoh had declined so rapidly that, outside of ceremonial purposes, he practically didn't do anything. If you're an Egyptian peasant, the goings-on within the royal palace essentially didn't affect you at all anymore. The royal officials who had once overseen work on canals, roads, and building projects were long gone, and in their place was the local government. However, no matter how ineffective it is in practice, an empty throne is still a tempting prize, and the outbreak of civil war is now an inevitability. Join us next week, as things somehow get even worse. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested.